Yes, very cool. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll give it just a, a couple more minutes, folks. Caitlin, that's my job. Sorry. I, get to, <laughs> I know. I get to remind people. You know, I have my watch. I'm all set. So, yeah. That looks like a very good showing. Good job, guys. Three more minutes. We'll start right at 12.05. Is anybody going to lead with the uh, Cannabis Alliance fight song, though? Ooh, what's the Cannabis Alliance fight song? I don't know. You haven't written it yet, have you? Oh, I write a lot of things, but music is not my strong suit. But I'm sure there's somebody in here that could make us a fight song. I was going to write I'm a fight sure. song, but then I got high. <laughs> <laughs> so true. I think I lost video just as well. Ooh, what do you got on your reading list, Ashley? Oh, those are actually my um, books from class. So that's, they're thick books. Oh, you can't see me. They're thick books and it helps me set my monitor on them. <laughs> Law, law books, law school books are the greatest for that because they're like this big and they're really hard covered and I had them all like I, you can all over my house there's stuff propped up with those things. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So the law books are $500 month. <laughs> exactly. It probably would have been a lot cheaper to get something else. Uh, at $500 uh, monitor stands. I, I'm not quite smart enough for law school. This is just project management books. <laughs> Everybody should probably have those in law school, but they, they don't actually equip us to do anything real. Yeah, I was going to say, Ashley, when you're done, I'd buy them off you. You know, just for funsies nighttime reading. <laughs> That's insane. All right, it is 12.05, and I am actually going to let Caitlin start our meeting today. So, Caitlin, are you ready? I'm all set. All right, um, I'm muting. What's that? I'm muted. Oh, good. I mean, not good that you're muted, but got it. <laughs> um, gosh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, this is a great turnout today. Um, I wanted to start by uh, talking about... If we look back, right, over the last six months, all of us probably would just go, uh, how did we end up here, right? Um, six months ago, the Cannabis Alliance was in a really strong position. Um, we were gaining membership. We hired a new executive director with um, excellent executive experience. And um, we were ready to take uh, everything by storm. And, and I remember talking about, we have this great foundation that's a launching pad uh, to get us to our goals. And the good news is that good, strong foundation that we were at six months ago has really served us well now that we are here in this space um, in the middle of the COVID universe. And uh, that foundation is also going to help us. Uh, if you read your newsletter this week, um, you will know that uh, Kristen has had to resign 
as our executive director. And um, we and her are very sad about that outcome. It's a family decision related to COVID. And I think all of us can uh, understand that um, lots of families are in those kinds of uh, decision-making modes. And um, we are delighted that Kristen is going to be sticking around as a member and a contributor um, because she has fallen in love with us as much as we have fallen in love with her. And uh, so we're lucky to, to keep her talents around within our organization. Um, as a result, uh, we are now uh, opening up a full search for a new executive director. And um, we have already been interviewing candidates and we will continue to interview more candidates. We already have uh, some great folks and I'm really excited for whatever this next step is. Uh, in the meantime, I will be stepping in as interim. I uh, request your patience and kindness as uh, I fill that role while we uh, search for a more qualified individual to, to take over. Um, but uh, like I said, I um, am really pleased that we have such an extraordinary base and foundation that in these really sort of difficult times, uh, we're able to look at our mission and our our membership and uh, really take this opportunity to, to shift, adjust, and uh, do what we do best, which is uh, moving towards a more uh, vital, sustainable, and ethical cannabis industry. So um, I want to welcome you all today and uh, also just uh, say thank you, uh, especially to Kristen uh, for coming in. She just got information and uh, drank it from a fire hose and uh, really has done an extraordinary job these last uh, six months. So if we could give a sign language uh, uh, round of applause for Kristen. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more after uh, we have our guest speakers uh, talk before we do our board's work. Um, right now we have Rick Garza, the director of the Liquor and Cannabis Board and Catherine Hoffman, also with the Liquor and Cannabis Board and they're gonna give us some updates on what's going on with the LCB. So Rick, if you're on, you're on. Hopefully. Let's see. Are they on yet? Or are they muted? Rick and Catherine. Okay. I don't see if, them. We might need to. I don't either. Yeah. All right. I will wait. I, we might do something in the meantime, and I will go ahead. Do you want to go over the board's work, and then we can go back to them? Yeah, I can Caitlin. do that uh, because it also uh, falls in alignment with what I was just talking about. So yeah. um, as we are uh, attending to the executive director, we also completed our board elections for this year and um, would love to introduce your new Cannabis Alliance Board of Directors. Um, we are welcoming uh, Ammon Ford as one of our new member board members. And um, let's see, oh, not that you guys have the same screen view as I do, but anyways. <laughs> um, also, Trey Reckling uh, is joining us as a board member, which we're very excited about. Um, and uh, Matthew Friedlander is uh, moving from an adjunct position to an elected board position, which is fantastic. Um, we also confirmed Jason Lammers. Uh, as an elected position after he stepped in for uh, one of our um, uh, board members who had to depart, Rachel. And um, Ryan Sevigny will remain on as an adjunct board member. So we, uh, yeah, let's, all the applauses, right? Um, the, uh, so we just already had a really great team of people and have now grown that uh, into an even more robust uh, extraordinary leadership team. Um, I highly recommend reaching out and introducing yourselves. If you don't know the new board members, I know that they would be excited to, to meet any of you that they haven't yet already met. Um, so that is uh, very exciting. Um, 
We uh, have been working on uh, some relief efforts for COVID-19 for our industry, especially since the federal government has ignored the fact that we even exist or that we are an industry. Um, one of the arms of that is a Facebook page, a Buy Nothing Facebook page. And um, I will get that in the chat for you here briefly. But uh, if you guys can just join, uh, the more people that are on there, the more effective the uh, process is. If you're not familiar with Buy Nothing pages on Facebook, it's a, a place where folks can either offer up items that they no, no longer need or want. Uh, for the community, or if there's an ask that you have, something that, that you're looking for that you need help with, uh, that's a place to go there. Um, and so a, a nice little community hub for, for folks to share resources uh, in this very difficult time, um, if you wouldn't mind working on that. Um, the uh, board has been participating in um, a round table with uh, three other cannabis organizations here in Washington State um, with the Washington Cannabis Business Association, the Craft Cannabis Coalition, and um, Washington Industry Sun Growers Association. And what we have been doing is finding ways to have a more united voice uh, in the cannabis industry in Washington State so that uh, in front of regulators and legislators, we are uh, presenting a more unified message about topics as they come forward. Um, we've been currently talking about the uh, CR 102 that is open. Uh, so this is also a handy reminder to you that there is a CR 102 open. And if you individually would like to make comments, um, I believe comments just closed. Um, but there is still a part of the process um, that will be open probably for more comments uh, moving forward. And so we'll make sure that you are alerted to that and uh, you can make comments. But so far the conversations with other organizations have been going very well. Um, we've mostly just been uh, sorting out how to, how to, to work together with uh, all the different ideas and voices, but uh, uh, feeling pretty positive about the direction that that's going in. Um, also, we had a uh, fun little thing happen. We had uh, a bunch of face shields donated and um, they, we had asked for a thousand thinking that probably that's a good number for our membership, but uh, uh, Kristen had 10,000 masks delivered to her driveway instead of the 1,000. So they have been out in distribution. Um, a lot of you already have claimed some, but there are plenty of masks. So um, please, uh, if you need them or you can think of an application, reach out to Kristen um, and we'll arrange a pickup or delivery on, on face shields. So um, a fun little accidental extra that uh, we would love uh, for you guys to apprise yourselves of. Um, another thing that we have started uh, that is a networking opportunity is um, a Black Authors Fiction Book Club um, that if you are interested, we will be looking at Black Fiction and uh, just a traditional book club. Like I said, it's uh, just a networking opportunity. But if you are interested, uh, reach out on Facebook. Uh, you can reach out to me directly, Caitlin Ryan, on Facebook, and uh, I'll get you added into that group and we'll get started on our first book here pretty soon. So uh, looking forward to maybe seeing some of you there. And with that, Kristen, I am scanning to see if we've got, we do. So for some reason, Kristen, I can't hear you. Let's see if that works. Yeah, it does. Ooh, it's double. Um, can we hear me now? All right. Uh, so let's see if Jason, Jason, Jason will do a, the, an update on his committee. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jason Lammers, uh, 420 Wholesale Pack. Just wanted to give everybody an update on our packaging waste committee and kind of what we're working on uh, going forward with that. 
Um, one of the things we've kind of learned through the process of doing this for a few years now is uh, any kind of real substantial change takes time, obviously. And uh, so to be kind of singularly focused on one uh, issue can kind of leg other issues to kind of work towards. And we obviously have a lot of sustainability issues to kind of address. And so we're going to rebrand our committee uh, and focus a little more broadly than just packaging. We're going to be doing uh, the cannabis, uh, the sustainable cannabis committee, and it'll be on everything sustainable, all sustainable issues. So uh, our next real big, big focus is going to be dealing with our, our plant waste legislation. We think there's a real opportunity to deal with that hopefully next year. Uh, so that's going to be probably our next big focus. And then uh, after that, you know, we think there's some opportunities in energy consumption that we can really address and be leaders in that space. And so we're really going to look at really anything that we think is a sustainable issue that affects our industry. We're going to we're going to try to tackle it and, and make it and improve those areas. So if uh, if anybody's interested in joining our committee with that kind of focus, a little bit of a change from just packaging now to kind of everything sustainable, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my phone number and email in the comments and uh, we'd love to have you guys uh, join up. Thank you, Jason. That's um, awesome. Okay. Let me, uh, is Rick Garza and Catherine Hoffman on the phone? They are here. Oh, fabulous. So Rick and Catherine, you may go ahead and take it away. Kathy's waiting for me, isn't she? Hi. Uh, good Hi, afternoon. yes, I am. <laughs> this is Rick. Um, can you see me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, Kristen, thank you for the opportunity to spend some time uh, with your team today. Um, I guess, you know, it's, it's a short period of time. We've got, I think, 45 minutes, Kristen. Is that correct? Yep, about 45 minutes, and we'd love to uh, maybe have you answer questions too at the yeah, end. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. So I'm thinking you can just jump into and stop me, but I'm thinking like 10 minutes and then uh, Q&A, and then I know Kathy has herself and our new team for rules and policy that we want to introduce. So how, do you, how does that work to get us started? So why don't we, um, let's go ahead and uh, Rick, if you don't mind, uh, do presentation and actually just what you outlined, uh, Q&A, and then I'll make sure that Kathy has enough time as well. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I want to talk about a couple of things with you. And then one thing I, I don't want to miss because um, I would be open to bringing a WebEx for your team, separate from your meeting that you're having today, so that we could put more time if needed to get specific about issues. We won't be able to cover everything today. So I'm just offering that as something that we haven't done for a little while now. So I want to offer that to your association, uh, Kristen, to let us plan on doing that next two to three weeks, if possible. And we can help put that together, uh, Gretchen in my office. So I want to offer that so we don't feel like, well, I'm not going to have an opportunity to ask the questions that I want. And if we need an hour, an hour and a half or longer, I want to offer that because that's a good opportunity. We just had some rules that Kathy's going to talk about that I'm sure you're interested in. And so I don't want this to be the only time we talk uh, in the next uh, few months. So let's, let's, let's plan on doing something in the next two or three weeks. Does that make sense? So, so let's just talk about the pandemic. As you know, uh, in March, the governor issued the Stay Home, Stay Healthy proclamation and issued decisions that were going to affect all the businesses in our state. Um, I think of all of you and I think how fortunate you were that unlike the alcohol industry that we regulate, uh, you were not closed. And that's a really, as you know, that's a really significant thing because in some parts of the country, and I'm part of a, a, regul a cannabis regulators roundtable that I may have not shared with you before, but we were actually hosted the first meeting several weeks, uh, several years ago, we meet every six months. We'll be meeting actually next month, virtually. But uh, we all got together to hear what was happening uh, around the country. And I was fortunate to be able to share that our businesses were not closed. Um, but uh, a lot of decisions had to be made quickly with respect. And I'm not gonna talk about the alcohol or vaping industry that we also regulate or tobacco. I wanted to just 
really spend my time in the cannabis space for you. But, um, you know, we had to work within the parameters of the governor's proclamations and, and obviously influence when that was appropriate. Um, but the first thing that we did, and just so you know how we operate. So here this proclamation comes in March. We've got to get all of our people out of our building, right? All of our employees, get them home, get them situated, um, make sure they've got the equipment and computers and whether it's surfaces and laptops so they can work. And that's licensing, enforcement, finance, and everybody else that supports that. So immediately in March, the first thing we had to do the first couple of weeks was determine how we were gonna get our people home and how they were gonna work from their home. And I can tell you for the most part, that's worked very well. So one thing I wanna throw out there for all of you is how has the lead time been and response from licensing, enforcement, finance? Are there gaps, are there issues? Uh, most of the response I've gotten from the cannabis industry is it's working well. But of course, before uh, we get off this call, I wanna know where there are gaps or issues. Uh, and Kristen, you've been awesome to always check in with me and send me emails and ask questions and make sure that we're responding. And in this situation, timely, because it's important uh, for your businesses. So we meet, uh, now it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but just so you know, we got everybody home and then we had this uh, order that close some of the businesses. So we started meeting uh, every morning at 10 a.m. and we would have a barrage of questions. It's not only from the cannabis industry, but mostly because the alcohol industry, because they were being closed. They could not do in dining, as you all know. And so we made allowances to allow for curbside delivery of spirits, beer and wine. You know what happened there. Um, and so we spent, a lot, we spent a lot of time on our legal policy team dealing with the myriad of questions that came uh, regarding help us figure out how we can continue to uh, operate as a business, provide allowances that I know normally you wouldn't do, but we won't survive as businesses, restaurants, taverns. Now we're dealing with nightclubs, as you all know, that are struggling after having been closed for three months now, who are asking, and in fact, I'll just so you know, we worked for a couple of weeks with the Department of Health and Labor and Industries to try to figure out a way for our nightclubs to be able to open statewide. We had some really good policies in place. We felt like if they followed, uh, because remember, in the phases that the governor created, nightclubs couldn't open until phase four, right? Which basically means we're normal. Um, and so we were working to try to figure out how to allow nightclubs to open in phase two and or three, we thought it, we had a way to figure this out if they followed the same protocols of restaurants slash taverns as far as social distancing and sanitization and everything else. And then for crying out loud, what happened, you know, two weeks ago and 10 days ago, the pandemic, uh, the risk and the number of positive cases in the state, in the counties, in the country skyrocketed. And you know what happened the last week, the governor said, stop. We're not gonna allow live entertainment. We're not gonna allow nightclubs to open. In fact, uh, even last week decided that when you were in phase three, typically the bars would be able to open uh, the bar seating and that was removed a few days ago. So we sit in this strange place because what the governor said at this point is, I will wait two weeks before I allow any county to move up a phase. And so we're in this whole pattern because we've seen such a huge increase in the number of positive cases. And I, I hope that hasn't impacted you. I know um, many of the allowances specific uh, to you and the and discussions we had with you had to do with curbside, had to do with window service. Uh, and, and, and that made total sense to us thinking about it strictly as a public health issue, right? Anything that keeps people from having to go into the stores where there's more contact, anything that allows you to continue to do business, whether it's curbside, whether it's with a window. Um, I think those accommodations were made. The first folks we heard from, uh, honestly, in Eastern Washington from the sun growers was, oh my God, they closed the schools. We got no daycare. What are we going to do with our kids? Would you please allow us to have our kids in the workspace? Uh, and I'll tell you, there was some consternation about that. Uh, from public health, from law enforcement, uh, but we felt that it was totally appropriate. I mean, you're in a situation where you're in a rural area, you have no schools open, 
Um, I'm sure it happens in the urban areas too, but the board and the staff worked hard to say, look, we've got to help here. We've got to allow uh, these kids to be able to be with their parents. And so we made the allowances. Now, ironically, you folks, because there's a push on everything we do. As soon as we did that, then King Five did an investigation and did this huge story that we were letting kids in the groves. And uh, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers were the opposing side with law enforcement and public health that said we were somehow uh, harming our kids um, by allowing the kids onto the grows. Just so you're aware, that was kind of the pushback immediately. I think we handled it well and just simply said, what, you know, people are not in a situation where they have any options. We're providing them an option by allowing the kids to be present on the farms. And so recognizing that all of these allowances are there through this pandemic in the phases. Remember, most of them will not be removed until we move into phase four. And phase four is normality. In other words, I suspect honestly with what we've seen, phase four is gonna be when we have a vaccine. Um, it sounds like to me, I mean, when I think about where we were in March and April, when I was thinking, well, this is gonna be a couple months, right? It's gonna be three months and then things are gonna get better and we're all gonna be able to get to phase three and four. I mean, in Thurston County, we're in phase three, uh, but we're starting to see an uptick in the number of positive cases. And so I, I don't see that that's gonna uh, change, but, um, but I did wanna share that uh, one of the, uh, I think the frustrating thing, not only for our employees, but for everyone in the state and especially, uh, and importantly, the industry is, I think we're gonna be stuck in this for quite some time. Um, and I'm sure you all recognize uh, this, um, I guess, you know, the blessing of all of this for all of uh, for, for all of you in this industry is you didn't get closed. And I don't see any indication that that, you know, you know me, I look at figures. I always look at, so what happened with our sales? Well, I can tell you the first month when everybody thought you were going to be closed, there was a 31% increase in sales for the month of March. Um, there's been a corresponding about 10% increase in sales every month forward uh, over the previous year. So not only, at least from a retail perspective, um, we haven't seen uh, a dramatic impact, a negative impact. Uh, we saw the hoarding that people did as they did, they did it with toilet paper, I guess they do it with cannabis too, uh, to, to try to stock up, uh, fearing that they wouldn't be able to get the product. So that means a pretty significant increase in sales uh, for our cannabis industry. And then, um, and so, um, I guess the point is, uh, when I look at some of the figures I've seen on the alcohol side, you, you have seen some really uh, good growth compared to last year. So, um, uh, and if that's different, and, you know, I guess we'd be very interested in hearing um, problems that you're having with respect to that, too. Um, I've already gone, uh, looks like 10 or 15 minutes, uh, Kristen, so I don't want to uh, take up time. I talked about the allowances. Um, the only thing I would add, remember the social equity uh, law that was passed this last session, where we have a number of licenses that have been returned or people have gone out of business on the retail side. And as you know, because we were one of the first in the country with Colorado, we had no social equity program. As we saw legalization occur in California, New York, Michigan, Massachusetts, and in the big cities like New York, Los Angeles, where you have large concentrations of communities of color, you saw an emphasis on creating a social equity program for licensure or for funding. And so we worked, um, Ollie Garrett, one of our board members, uh, actually attended a conference almost two years ago, a year and a half ago in Boston with other regulators who were considering how to put a social equity program together. I, I'm not gonna go into it all because you, you all, you know, I saw the Black Lives Matter um, poster uh, uh, that one of you had. Um, I don't have to go into why we think that's important. It was obviously to deal with the injustice of the war on drugs which predominantly impacted Hispanics, African-Americans, Native Americans, uh, everyone, but not just folks of color, as you know. But this is an opportunity to try to address something that we didn't address early on. Uh, and so that bill passed, as you all know. They were supposed to form the task force and meet by July 1st by law, but as you know, the pandemic changed everything. 
Um, what I can share with you is members are being named uh, in the last few days. Uh, and so the task force is being put together. I believe it's around 18 individuals. Um, and, um, and we'll get that out to you as soon as I have it, Kristen. You may have it already. Um, but um, the work of that committee hopefully will be September. It could be late September, early October that they meet the first time. Um, but the idea there is to help the liquor board uh, determine with the task force how are we gonna create the criteria for how you would apply and meet a social equity uh, app, uh, uh, process, a social equity applicant? And as you know, we only have a handful of licenses right now. Part of the work of that task force will be to bring forward recommendations to the legislature of what should be done beyond the licenses that we have available. To be totally honest with you, that's not something that uh, we feel uh, we're equipped to determine. That's why we've got a legislative task force. This really is a legislative task force, not a liquor board task force that's going to be working. There's legislators on, on this task force. There's many members of the industry, uh, your industry, on the task force. And so it's an opportunity to hear from everybody and have a large discussion about how do we try to help those individuals uh, who may have not have access to the licenses originally in communities of color have access to the licenses that we have available. I'm going to stop there because I've even gone further than I thought, uh, Kristen, as far as the time. And then if you have questions or anyone, I want to always make sure we have, we keep time for Kathy and our team. Um, we do. I think I see one question in the chat box here. Uh, they want to, uh, somebody wants to know if LPB has any bill proposals for the 2021 legislative session formed yet? You know, um, <clears throat> given COVID, we had, uh, typically we'll have proposals that will come from licensing or finance or enforcement. Um, usually technical changes. This last session, we had some pretty significant legislation, including the social equity license. We have no bills that I'm aware of that we would move forward right now. What I've asked folks is, and, and remember folks, one thing I didn't talk about, we've got a huge budget crisis going on with respect to state government. And we, were, we took a 10% hit as an agency a few months ago. Instructions that came from OFM for the 21-23 biennial budget, remember we budget every two years in the state, is we begin providing a proposal with a 15% cut in the agency. And what that will re mean in the future, says I was around in 2009 and 10 when we went through the Great Recession and I was working in this agency and we got hit like everybody else. And so uh, the reason why I'm saying with respect to policy, I don't believe that we're gonna move forward with any uh, proposals. There was a bill that was run by the industry to allow for CBD, to allow for other products other than marijuana related products to be sold in our stores. That's something that we do wanna work with you about. And I've contacted okay. uh, some of the other associations to say in the next few months, Chris Thompson will reach out to you and we'd like to sit down with you and get that figured out because I think um, here it's been how many years I'm not sure that you should be forced to create an ancillary business right next to your retail shop. It's kind of a scam, right, folks? It's like, well, wait a minute. You're making me incur additional costs to sell things in my store that I should be able to sell in my store. But of course, I'm reduced back to the marijuana or marijuana-related products. So Kathy will be working with us and our team with you on that. That would be the only thing I would say that would impact you that we'll be looking at. And I actually told uh, Kristen and others that would not be an agency request legislation. That's an industry proposal that we would work with you to work on so that, of course, we're comfortable with that. But I think if we do that together, working hand in hand, we, we shouldn't have much uh, resistance. I know there was resistance this last session. So I, I'm rambling now, but there is that one <laughs> issue that I think we should work with you on to figure out if we can get other items to be sold in your stores than just the way how narrow the law is today. So I'll stop there. Uh, is LCB going to be, would you be willing to support the home grow bill this, this session? You know, I think, you know, it, how many years now? Seven? Seven that that bill's come forward and not moved forward. 
And typically yeah. what we've done is just stayed out of it. Um, that's really a discussion between the industry and, and legislators. And um, I think we took a neutral position um, the last two years. Um, and um, I just don't, I just don't know that we want to, I, I mean, Kristen, you know, that's, that's a good discussion with the board too. That's just not a decision okay. I make or staff. That's a discussion with the board, but um, okay. I, I don't know why it would change at this point, but uh, we're open to it always. I mean, we have this discussion every year. It just um, hasn't gone the, anywhere. So that's the concern. Yeah, I know. I, I think if we attack a little uh, tax incentive, it might go somewhere. Hmm. Um, wh what about uh, delivery? Is the LCB open to looking at delivery, considering considering the fact that we're in the mid middle of a pandemic and it might be a good way to have a less touch op option than going into the stores? Well, I think that, as with all of this, it changes things, right, with respect to consideration of things like delivery. If it's if it's something that helps with respect to the pandemic, then yeah, we would be willing to work with you to consider that and talk with staff and talk with the board about that. So yes, we would. Okay. And the other only thing that's come up this is um, fingerprinting has been impossible. Is there an interim policy for allowing uh, fingerprinting obviously is hard in COVID. How are you guys handling fingerprinting um, yeah, for I licensing, Kathy, et cetera? I can get that for you. Kathy, I thought that we had stopped that or we were holding on people needing to to do that. I could be wrong. Kathy, do you have any idea? I don't have any information on that, but I'm happy to find out for you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think we That'd did something. I think we did something to halt the need for people to do that. Agreed. But I could be uh, wrong. I could be wrong too. But we'll, we'll get to okay. it, Kristen, and we'll get back by email. Kathy, if you could help us with that, that'd be great. Absolutely. Okay, I have one more question and then we'll let the time go over to Kathy. Uh, once criteria requirements for social, I'm sorry, reading it on the chat box. Once criteria requirements for social equity applicants have been set by the LCB and the task force, how long would an applicant know what areas would be considered to be disproportionate and be able to apply for? Yeah. So do we, have you figured that out yet? Have you set those criteria? <clears throat> well, I think what, no. And what we'll do is we'll rely upon the task force. That's why it's named. And that's why it's not the board that's doing the work around that. It's going to be Christy Hoff, who has done disparity study work at uh, the health department. And she's well, well equipped around this area. To be totally honest with you, how I see it working is we look to the task force to help us understand the criteria that would be used for the program. And then I hand it off to Kathy and our rulemaking team to create rules to put it into place. But one will not come before the other. We're not doing okay. this work. It is the task force that's doing the work. And that's the beauty of this is you'll have many industry members on that task force that can give feedback for how practical or not this criteria is that will be established. But we will, we will, and this is really important because there's a lot of rumors out there that I keep hearing about how the board's doing this or that around the social equity program. Folks, we don't do anything. We make no policy or rules around this until the task force provides the information to us. So if people are telling you we're looking at opening up 50 new licenses or a lot of the rumors that I hear about, about this, absolutely nothing is happening at the LCB until the task force provides information directly to us of how we would do this. And then the beauty of that, it gives you all the ability to have input into that process. And you will in the rulemaking process that comes after that with Kathy and her team and the board. One more question and then we, sorry, somebody else asked a question, we'll, then we'll get Kathy going. Sorry, is uh, changing the in-person requirement for the medical database um, on the table because of the pictures? It, you know, compromised patients are afraid to come in. It'd be cool if they could send in a digital picture to the store that they verify by face rather than requiring the employee to take the picture. Kristen, just send it to me for the team, the legal policy team. Okay. Ask the question okay. to us. I'll bring it to our team and we'll get on it right away. All right. Good question. That works. All right. Kathy, it's all yours. Sorry, we were. You're oh, rulemaking. No, <laughs> no worries at all. 
Um, well, it, it, when I came on, I was really happy to see so many of you that I have missed seeing um, since the since with the shutdown and having to work from home. So it's really good to see Mitzi. I've kept in contact with you, and good to see Danielle and Caitlin, Sean. Good to see your face as well. These are the folks I can see, and Kristen, of course. Good to see you too. So um, thanks. Thanks very much for inviting both of us to be here, but that's kind of a special treat for me to be able to see you. Um, also want to extend thanks for just the collaboration of Cannabis Alliance since I've been with LCB, but more importantly in the last year and some of the good work that we've done together putting walls forward. So um, your participation and input is always appreciated and always very welcome. Um, so just to share a little bit about the new unit that I'm leading now, so um, kind of understand where I fit in the scheme of things and introduce, um, uh, I know one of the new uh, role coordinators is on this call, and I don't know who does the muting or unmuting, but if you could unmute Casey Schaffler, that would be great. Um, he sent me a message to say, hey, I can't unmute myself. <laughs> um, but anyway, We've established a legal and policy unit, and within that is housed um, our rules program, and then eventually we'll have um, a, a program that develops interpretive statements. Um, so there'll be one-stop shopping for um, any licensee who wants to understand how the LCB might interpret a particular rule or a concern. Um, and joining me to do that work is our new rules coordinator, Casey Schaffler. And is Casey unmuted now? I can't find Casey, so I'm trying to look for him. I asked him to raise his hand. Okay. Well, anyway. Is he a, does he have a phone number? And I could it's probably just a phone number. 47 names, so it takes oh, a while to go through. Oh, apologies. All right. Anyway, so Casey, um, uh, there's Casey. Casey Schaffler. Yeah, he says it's his phone number. Um, what? Do you know what that? Okay. Anyway, I'll just keep going here. So Casey is one of our new co rules coordinator, and so is um, Audrey Basic. Um, each of them are sharing responsibilities at this point, but Casey is taking more of an interest in ca the cannabis rule work. So you may have heard him. Um, presenting rule packages and giving rule updates at board meetings. So that will be um, uh, the, the work that he's taking on right now. Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit about the rule work in a minute. But what this allows me to do is ex engage with all of you um, in an expanded capacity. So we'll be able to do different kinds of engagement like deliberative dialogue um, when we're developing you know, rules that we want to work on, concerns that you bring to us, I'll be able to spend more time working with you on those concerns and developing policy as well. Um, and I really am anxious to strengthen our rule program in the way that we have with our listen and learn sessions and adding these additional ways to engage with you um, to develop meaningful rules and policy in the future. So any questions on that before I start kind of launching into what's happening with rules right now. Okay. So I guess I'll just start at the top. I think uh, many of you um, were on the line yesterday when we had our public hearing on the quality uh, control rules. Um, thanks to those of you who provided public testimony and participated with us on rule development. Next steps for that particular rule project, and really what we're, we're doing there is contemplating bringing in the requirement for pesticide and heavy metal testing for all marijuana products in Washington State. Um, we'll take all the comments that were received, both in writing, and there were many, I think we were up to about 45 or 46 by close of business yesterday, and all of the content that you provided by way of public hearing, We'll analyze those comments and make a determination whether we need to incorporate those comments, those changes into the rules, which would more than likely result in a supplemental CR 102, meaning that would bring us to another public hearing, or 
um, if we don't accept those comments or incorporate them into those rules, provide reasons um, why we didn't or did in the concise explanatory statement that would come out as part of the CR 103 package. Um, and that was a really significant role project. We've been working on that for a considerable amount of time. I think everybody's fully aware of that. Uh, next rule project that's in process and set for public hearing is true party of interest. Um, that's set for public hearing on August 5th. Um, let me get to the kind of highlights of that particular project. Um, it was one of the first projects that we did a virtual listen and learn session for, which was kind of tough because we're used to doing those sessions with you in person. So thanks for um, helping us work out some of the, the, the uh, challenges that sort of result with uh, the virtual environment, but we did glean a lot of really good um, information from you and um, incorporated some of those changes in our proposal. What was presented to the board for, um, we presented the proposal to the board on June 24th, and then we currently have the hearing scheduled for August 5th on that. So look forward to your participation and attendance there. But the highlights of that rule, the, the, the changes that we brought to the two party of interest rules were to remove the spousal vetting requirement. That was a, a pretty significant change. Um, we more clearly defined what a financier means in this space, and we also distinguished financiers from true parties of interest to make sure that that was clear. Um, we also more clearly describe what a true party of interest is not. I think in the previous rules, there were maybe one or two examples. So we expanded on that pretty significantly. And then we also expand guidance on when to notify the LCB that funds have been invested in a licensed business. So that incorporated a, a, a board interim policy that we entered in December of um, 2018. Um, let's see, what else are we working on? Sorry. Um, some of you participated in our listen and learn sessions around tier one expansion. Um, so we initiated that rulemaking in December of last year to consider increasing the canopy limits for the smallest of our marijuana protection operators. Um, and we recognize that the economies of scale were the most challenging generally um, for the smallest production operations. So we wanted to talk about ways that maybe tier ones could incrementally expand their total production capacity um, and maybe talk about it, uh, uh, allowing that expansion based on the production of DOH compliant products. So we did have two listen and learn sessions. We opened up the whole rule section that would apply here, and that's 314.55075. And I know this was um, something new for the cannabis industry to be able to meet with the LCB and look at an existing rule set without us putting any conceptual language into it and just talk about it. And so, um, Casey is currently working on curating all the comments we received because there were a lot of comments. We had two hours between each section. Um, it sounded like initially there was sort of some confusion from folks about the kinds of things we could change. And there are some parts of the rule that really are reflective of the statute that we can't change. So some folks were offering up changes that they thought um, we could make in rule that we couldn't because they're statutorily required, but we did glean some other information. And when we have that, um, um, that process complete, I think Casey's pretty close to completion, we'll be able to reconvene that group and talk as well. Um, another thing that came out of those conversations was a request from some of the tier ones to just be able to meet with LCB individually and, and talk about the concerns that they had. And so we're considering um, putting together a deliberative dialogue session with just our tier ones to sort of let them talk about the things that are concerning to them and ideas that they have with respect to increasing canopy. Because I think in the session, um, I think we maybe had just a handful of tier ones 
and the other participants, and it was fine, were um, tier twos and threes. So since that rule making was really focused on tier ones, we wanted to give them an opportunity to meet with us separately. And of course, we'll share the outcome of that meeting publicly as well. So that's what's happening with tier one at this point. Um, next up are the volunteer compliance rules. Some of you might remember those from um, House Bill 5318. And those have been codified now in um, RCW 6953-42 and 561. Um, again, we had a great listen and learn session with all of you. We now have those rules um, back from the code revisor and getting ready to put the um, 0102 package together. But what those do is set up a program for you to meet with LCB um, to talk about things that maybe um, you have questions about in terms of is this particular uh, part of my business compliant? How can I come into compliance if I need to, et cetera? So it gives you a way to meet with LCB um, and not, it's, it's almost sort of a safe harbor, a way to be able to connect with um, our um, agency representatives and talk to you about whether or not um, parts of your retail establishment, you know, meet the requirements of rule, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so very, very much looking forward to bringing that, um, bringing that rule project. And I think the CR 102 will be ready for um, presentation to the board on August 5th. And as usual, you know, we'll, we'll publish that um, uh, with our board materials that um, I, I think Dustin puts those out to the, to, for public consumption about a week ahead of time. So very happy to bring that forward. Uh, let's see, yesterday, um, Casey um, presented and the board um, approved for filing um, two CR 101 documents. The first is to implement the legislative requirements of House Bill 2826. Um, that's THC vapor products. A lot of work to be done there, um, especially around definitions like terpenes, botanical terpenes. I know this isn't news to any of you. Um, we have been working internally to put together some draft conceptual rules that we can use as a basis for our listen and learn sessions there. Um, the next uh, that Casey brought forward was to implement House Bill, um, pardon me, uh, 6206. That's the marijuana certificate of compliance. So that's just a, a sentence really that we're adding to an existing section of rule. We don't anticipate that we will need a listen and learn session for this. We're just essentially going to include the sentence that's re statutorily required to our rule and then move that to a CR 102. Of course, that doesn't preclude you from commenting on the rules. Of course, we, we wanna hear from you on that. Um, we also withdrew a CR 101 on marijuana retail certificates. It, we have a board interim policy in place um, that, that's doing what it needs to at this point. So we're not going to move forward with rulemaking on that and withdrew that yesterday. And I think that's all we have in play right now for rules. And I think I unmute. I unmuted Casey. Oh, we think we unmuted oh, Casey, so okay. Casey should be able to speak up. So Casey, yeah, are you able to hear me? Yeah, are. Sorry about that. We had to guess on phone numbers. <laughs> no, no, good guess. So thanks for having me and, and Kathy. I think you captured uh, all the work that we're working on. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I have one question um, from the audience and that it was, there's a big difference between active canopy flowing into 502 versus overall licensed canopy. What can be done to reduce the unused canopy and transfer to active licenses that need more canopy? So basically some, some shifting of canopy. Is there any thought about, is that that's some different rulemaking or what, what could we do about that? Um, I'm gonna ask Rick to chime in on this one, but, um... I, I'm going to leave that to Rick. Thank you. 
That's a big question, Sean. <laughs> no, I, think it, I think it's, a, a, again, um, Kristen, I think that's one to post to us uh, with the other one directly. That's not an idea that I've heard, which is yeah. what about taking that? Because there's a lot of um, square footage that's not being used. Um, mm -hmm. And so I don't think anybody's ever said, what about uh, providing it to someone else because it's already licensed? Remember, the reason why we've always been concerned about doing this is because there was a sense from all of you that we had a glut of product. And if we allow for more to be grown, it's going to place uh, pressure on those producers out there when we felt, and that was a couple of years ago, things have stabilized. But if we allow for more product to be available, how does that impact um, the industry? But I, but I think it's still a, a really good question. What about those that aren't using their full capacity? The question would be, what if they choose to tomorrow, next week, next month, that now I want to go larger, but you've taken that from me possibly and given it to someone else. So I, but, but I think it's a really good one uh, to bring to us for a discussion internally and we'll get back to you. So I, I don't mean okay. to pass the buck, but I don't know the answer. Right, and thanks for that, Rick. And also, Sean, I, I recollect that you brought this, did you bring this to our discussion on because when I was I was reading it in the chat and I thought that sounds awfully familiar. I think you brought that up. So <laughs> thank you for bringing it up here again. <laughs> yeah, I, I am enjoying watching Danielle work, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Really funny. The ultimate multitasking is great. And, um, stickering and ordering and barcoding and then counting. Thank you. Wearing our fine face shield. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Panelist Lions, for these. They're fantastic. I'm so glad. Um, I'm so uh, glad. There's one other thing I wanted to share before I signed off or, or you know, answered another question, but I wanted to share that we are, you may have noticed that we have slowed down rulemaking. There's a couple reasons for that. First, um, one of the, one of the Things that I heard from actually many of you when I um, came to LCB was that we made we engaged in rulemaking and we did it pretty rapidly and there was you know there was reason for that I think the industry was relatively young and we were trying to get rules in place a framework to establish you know some sort of um, baseline to move forward so there were rules were were coming out in pretty rapid order and and Clearly, it seemed like there was a reason for that, but we're at a place now where we can kind of slow that down and be a little more surgical about the rulemaking that we're doing so that we can address specific concerns. Also, and this kind of speaks to the allowances that Rick was talking about when he opened today. I'm anticipating that many of the allowances that we've provided at LCB and, and certainly other agencies have as well are going to become discussion during the legislative session and could very well result in legislation. And therefore, that typically means that we have to contemplate rulemaking to go along with that. So we're hoping to move many of the projects that we currently have in play on both the cannabis and the liquor side of um, uh, our rules program so that we have the capacity to move any rules that result from the 2021 legislative session forward um, in a timely manner. I think sometimes every once in a while and pretty much every session, I think there's some a piece of legislation and this time it happened on the liquor side of the house, but there's a piece of legislation that requires kind of protracted rulemaking. Um, on the cannabis side of the house this year, that was 2826. I don't anticipate that, that, that those rules are going to, you know, come about in rapid order. What, actually, our timeline, I think, has a CR103 projected for some time in early January. But we want to be able to, to have the capacity for our rules coordinators to be able to take on a significant amount of body of work, a significant body of work that we 
anticipate will result from the 2021 session. So just wanted to offer that up. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's just, a good you know, reason. <laughs> really, we're not, you know, we're not, we're not inactive. We're just sort of being strategic so that we're in a good place, you know, when legislation is enacted and we're able to plan it moving forward in a thoughtful way. And it also helps you to plan for changes and sure. participate with us in rural development as well. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, Kathy. I really appreciate you coming to our meeting today. And you're welcome to stick around and listen to all sorts of other stuff. No, I just uh, thank you for the opportunity. It always gives me a chance to um, to commend Kathy, who's just really taken us to another level with respect to rulemaking and just the transparency and the listen and learns. You know, you learn having done this for so many years that there are always more ways to be transparent. And, and given the COVID, it's good we had a, a system in place like that where we could provide answers quickly. Um, and that, that whole legal policy team was part of the reorg that we're doing is to be able to have a team of folks who do nothing for the board but deal with these legal policy issues where we were more fragmented in the past now with Kathy and her team, um, we have the ability to be more strategic, both inside and outside the organization. Before I leave, Kristen, I talked a little bit about, uh, are there gaps, are there issues? Do you feel like you're getting the kind of response from us when you reach out to us, any of your members, whether it's licensing, whether it's enforcement, whether it's finance, um, you don't have to answer that now, but remember, bring that to us and then I'm not gonna forget that I wanna do, if you're comfortable and you folks can talk about it when we leave, would you like to do a WebEx? Do you feel like you got enough information? I'll wait, wait to hear back from you. Uh, be safe, be well, take care, nice to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you both, I appreciate it. Thank you everyone and look forward to talking to you soon. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to step in for Al since Al is actually having um, lunch with his daughters, which is a rare bird. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, they were supposed to have a special session in the legislature on the budget. Um, they, they know the budget is a huge mess. Unfortunately, they're actually not going to have it in August because we have a lot of people running for their seats and can't um, break away and plus they're still trying to struggle on how we're going to have a legislative session with COVID. So he made a political rec recommendations contributions list of um, that will be very good for the cannabis industry and so I will go over those really quickly um, and and if you have questions obviously you can email me and I can also send this list to you um, via email. But for the 2020 uh, legislative elections, the primary election will be held on August 4th. Obviously, the general election on November 3rd, which we're all looking forward to way too much. Um, contributions to individual legislative candidates from a donor is limited to $1,000 per election. So $1,000 for primary and $1,000 for the general. So Al recommends uh, for the Senate, Derek Stanford, he's a Democrat. He's a key member of the Senator Labor and Commerce Committee, and he's been very supportive of cannabis industry. Andy Billing is a Democrat. He's also the Senate Majority Leader. Ron uh, Mazal, a Republican from Whidbey Island. He's supportive on cannabis issues. And then supporting both Democrat and Republican caucuses, because it also helps getting uh, access to leadership during legislative session. And we always want to support both Democrats and Republicans because things can flip and we want to, we want to be, we want to look um, neutral. In the House, uh, Strom Peterson, he's a Democrat and he's the chair of the Commerce and Gaming Committee. We see a lot of him during the legislative session. Shelley Kloba, Democrat and a huge cannabis supporter, very supportive. She's been to our happy hours. Um, she's lovely. Sharon Shoemake, uh, she's a Democrat in a tough race up in Whidbey Island. Um, 
Danielle's been very good about introducing us. She's been the sponsor of the Cannabis Commission Bill and would like to get that through the next legislative session. It's Whatcom Larry County, Spring not Oh, sorry, Whatcom County. It was a W. Yes. Uh, Whatcom <laughs> County. You're up there. Uh, Larry Springer, Democrat. He's also in leadership position. Lori Jenkins, Democrat, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Roger Goodman, Democrat, longtime cannabis supporter. J.T. Wilcox, Republican, House Minority Leader, and he's been having a op really good open door to the Cannabis Alliance and also contributing to the House Democrat and Republican caucuses. So those are our recommendations for these upcoming, and it's coming up pretty fast with less than a month to go for the primaries. And then also on the 29th of July, the Cannabis Alliance is having a fundraiser for Tara Simmons. She is formerly incarcerated. She's an attorney and she's running for the 29th legislative district. And I would love it if you guys all attended with me. So if you, um, I will post a list there. I'll post the list in the chat. And I'll also, um, if you send me an email like Kristen, dot baldwin at the cannabis alliance dot us i'll make sure you get put on that that invitation list for tara simmons i think she's going to be really instrumental in helping us with uh criminal justice reform so that is really really great um and yes roger has claimed he couldn't support cannabis bills that's true sean but he has apparently changed his tune so um we will uh we will continue to work with that. And, um, uh, next one, ooh, if yeah, I can jump in really quickly, um, we are working on uh, also repackaging uh, our pack. Um, so while we are encouraging you to donate individually, certainly um, also consider that um, somewhere in your budget uh, contributing to the Cannabis Alliance pack. And what we use that for um, are sometimes fundraisers, but uh, a lot of times if we're having individual meetings, uh, that's usually a good time for the Alliance to uh, donate uh, for on your behalf. A good effective uh, way to say hi, we're here. Yeah, no kidding. Very effective way to say hi, we're here. Perfect. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks for weighing in on the pack. Yeah. Um, Neil, Neil, you have t you t the time is all yours. Let's have you talk about full spectrum and what's going on. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, so yeah, I just uh, been, uh, I'm here to speak today about the full spectrum and what it is that we've been doing and kind of like just issues that queer LGBTQ people face in the industry and things that um, brands in particular could do better um, at addressing these issues. So basically, um, bullying and harassment, uh, LGBTQ youth are harassed from youth, like as children, they're bullied in schools, they're um, more likely to be thrown out of the house. About 40% of homeless teens are LGBTQ, 40%, like that's way disproportional from like how the population identifies. Um, but the, the problem is this carries on into the workforce or the workplace and about 40 per 46% of LGBTQ people are in the closet at work, about 46% are hiding who they are. And this has like some serious ramifications that will affect their lives, their work, their coworkers and your, um, your place of employment. Um, so basically, people who are hiding, it's usually because they're afraid to be stereotyped, they're afraid to make other people feel uncomfortable, they're concerned that coworkers might think that they're attracted to them in some way. Um, and so they hide who they are. They don't bring their full authentic selves to the workplace. They, um, they misgender their spouse to kind of just 
hide who who the gender of their spouse or they pretend that they don't exist at all or they you know whatever it is and so basically when you hide at work it becomes a huge distraction to be it's exhausting to spend time and energy to pretend to be somebody else to not feel comfortable in your surroundings and not feel comfortable to open up and it just kind of um, inhibits your potential for growth and um, diverse thoughts. Um, and then transgender employees particularly are subjected to um, harsher harassment than other um, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. Um, for example, restroom accessibilities um, being deliberately referred to as the incorrect pronouns. Um, gendered dress codes. So like, for example, requiring females to wear makeup or three pieces of jewelry or skirts or something and having the males have to have their hair clipped to a certain length. It's just gendered and unnecessary. Um, and, and also um, trans individuals are also, they have to tolerate inappropriate questions um, pretty frequently. So just three weeks ago, about three weeks ago on June 15th, the Supreme Court ruled that the Civil Rights Act um, protected employees from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. So just three weeks ago. Before that, oh, it was 28 states did not have any kind of protection. That's more than half of the states did not have that until three weeks ago. This is like very new, very fresh stuff. Like, um, but it's, it, it's, nice to not be to have those protections put into place just, just but um i also want to mention that we are the 78th country to do so so we're not really leading the world in um in uh, our inclusivity um there have been so many studies done that have shown that if you are a diverse workplace, you're going to be more profitable. You're more likely to be more profitable. If you are ethnically, racially diverse, you're about 35% more likely to be profitable. And if you have a diversity with um, uh, sexual and gender minorities, you're another 15% more likely to be profitable. So it's it, when you have an environment where people can be themselves, you are able to have an, a, a um, more innovation and more retention as well. So um, people are able to speak their mind. You're able to direct the conversation into a healthier space. Um, I've been in a number of meetings in a number of workplaces where I've had to direct the marketing to be a little more tasteful. Um, um, but and having those voices in the room help guide how you your decision making process. And it could make you so much more open to, um, to yeah, just being a, a better space. Um, with retention, 67% of people on Glassdoor said having a diverse workplace was something that they was an important factor when evaluating a place to, um, to work. Um, I also have strongly felt that including LGBTQ people into the cannabis industry, it honors the history of medical marijuana. Um, the during the AIDS crisis of the 80s, cannabis provided relief to AIDS patients before there were actual AIDS meds. Like back when they were putting everyone on chemo, not knowing what it would do to them, and putting them on different types of things. It was literally providing relief and giving them munchies be, to, be, to be able to um, help them with wasting syndrome was a huge thing. Um, 
Brownie Mary in in the 80s was baking about 50 dozen brownies in her kitchen every day and giving them to patients around San Francisco. She was arrested three times, but eventually San Francisco named a day in her honor. Um, Dennis Perone was the father of medical marijuana. He was a gay man who also wrote Proposition P, which is the first legislation for medical marijuana in 1996. Um, I also, while talking about the history, I want to mention, I, we've, I've discussed um, queer people, they're more at risk to be, to have lower grades and to be thrown out, but they're also more likely to use cannabis than he their heterosexual counterparts. Um, from the drugabuse.gov, they've got this um, statistic. 37 or 30% of sexual minorities use have used cannabis in the last year compared to 13% of heterosexual people. So sexual and gender minorities are more than twice as likely to use cannabis than heterosexual people. So I personally feel like this industry should be overrun with queer people, but I can name the number of transgender individuals who work in this industry on one finger, not one hand, one finger. Um, so getting into things that we can do to make the workplace um, a more welcoming place for all people. Um, it's set and enforce workplace discrimination policies. So about 93% of Fortune 500 companies already have a policy like this in place. So good policy includes, I'll post this in the comments, but a good non-discrimination policy includes clear language that discrimination will not be tolerated, specifics about prohibited behavior such as joking or what whatnot, um, a description of the penalties for violating the policy, a clear outline or grievance, grievance procedure for an employee who has experienced discrimination, prompt investigation of complaints of discrimination, and protection against retaliation. So um, those six things really help make a, a solid non-discrimination policy. And I really recommend that you all put one in your resources immediately. Um, having gender neutral restrooms, like why are you gendering your restrooms anyway? It's, we all have to use the restroom. It's not hard to put a gender neutral placard. Uh, you know, they're pretty cheap. You can get one on Amazon for, five dollars you know it's um it's really helpful to um or it's it's imperative to provide your employee with a safe and convenient restroom and um single stall restrooms are generally a pretty safe um and a great solution um keeping an open dialogue around social issues show you care about issues impacting their lives outside of work uh, having some internal education, putting together a pronoun class. Uh, I have, I've definitely, I've been a part of these in the cannabis industry, in my workplaces. I've had pronoun classes and I think it's really nice and helpful. Um, I was working in a space where we had a um, inventory specialist who was coming over for the day and they use gender neutral pronouns. And before they showed up, there were a number of employees who were just saying, hey, by the way, this person goes by gender neutral pronouns, like letting us know before that individual even got there. So it's just really nice to have a respectful dialogue about what it is to what why why gender neutral pronouns are important and um and how you can help people feel um comfortable just existing in your space um dress codes so having policy or not avoiding policy that reinforces gender stereotypes. So makeup, jewelry, skirts, heels, 
hair length, that kind of thing. So um, you can have, by all means, have a dress code policy, wear all black, have a, you know, like a polo, whatever it be, but there's no reason to make it um, unnecessarily gendered. Um, do you have inclusive benefits? Do you offer benefits to same gendered spouses? Do you have family and medical leave for same gendered spouses who might not have um, legal, um, just legal rights for a child? Do you provide, um, do you have transi transition related care? Um, so just basically, if you provide insurance, I think it's um, uh, really important to make sure that you provide it to, to your same gendered spouse and make sure that everyone it, when, within their family unit can benefit from it. Uh, celebrate Pride Month as a brand. Pride Month was last month. Um, I know it was not with Corona, COVID, there hasn't been a, a whole lot that's been happening. But um, in the past, the full spectrum, we've gone all over Washington State and participated in local parades. There's about 15 different prides in the state of Washington. So um, it's there, there's a lot of opportunities to be active. I will say that the Liquor Control Board does not really like having brands, um, brand recognition in parades, but as organizations, we're absolutely able to be, uh, have that representation. Um, using your platform to spread support, blogs, newspapers, social media platforms. Um, in your marketing, take a stand and openly share your support for the community in front of your entire audience. Don't just be pandering to the community that you're trying to say that you support. Show the entire audience that you have this support. Um, take action. Don't just talk about it, but actually get involved. So uh, participate in fundraising, volunteering, and community events that support the LGBT community. Something that we do pretty irregularly with the full spectrum is we volunteer our time with Lifelong, with their Chicken Soup Brigade program that offers meals to patients of all kinds that's delivered all over Washington State. Um, we're not really doing this as a group right now because we're not really supposed to be doing things as groups, but that program is still in place. It has been an essential um, service. And so you can still volunteer your time and go down there solo or with a, um, or with, you know, a child. They do allow um, uh, children that are 12 and over to go and, um, and take part as well. Um, do not share a person's sexual orientation or gender identity with others unless specifically given permission to do so. It's just respect the privacy and, and uh, just maintain that trust. Trust is an active, ongoing thing. You you have to hold the trust. You have to continually um, prove that you are trustworthy to maintain the trust. Um, Never ask about a person's body parts, sexual practices, or medical information. Just don't. Um, change your hiring strategies. So in your ad for, for your job, make an explicit mention of your commitment to equality and diversity. Talk about your company values and the benefits that demonstrate that commitment. Um, take job application, take job applicants names off of their resumes, put your ads in places like um, the Facebook group, Seattle Queer Jobs, there's over 8,000 people who are, are in that Facebook group. Um, don't hire someone because they're gay, but <laughs> just because they're gay, but also don't not hire someone just because they're gay. Like you should just not even take that into consideration. You should just like hire 
people based on their experience and their skill set and not their sexuality or tokenism or exclude people because of the same reason. Um, and then locally, there's a couple organizations that you can participate in as well. Um, here in Seattle, there, well, actually Washington State, um, there's the GSBA, the Greater Seattle Business Association, which is the largest LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce in North America. It's right here in Seattle, here in Washington State. Um, there's over 1,300 businesses that participate in this organization, and they do a ton of great things, networking events that... Um, that I've been a part of. They do uh, Young Professionals with Pride. They do Women on Top. Um, they have a scholarship program that's fantastic. Um, they are also flexible in pricing right now during this COVID time. So if you don't have like tons of money to be spending to participate, they are um, doing things on a sliding scale. They're working with people. They want people to be involved and active and have their voices heard and be supported. So um, I'll list links and all this um, in when I am done talking. I'm just kind of, you know, going. <laughs> but, um, also, I do want to mention, I know right now that people may feel a certain kind of way about the police department with um, uh, current events, but the Seattle Police Department did develop the safe space training. And I do feel that this is an important um, program which was designed to assist victims of hate crimes to report that those hate crimes actually existed and to seek help in um, in and safety so basically it's a free voluntary program that all businesses can take part in. Every Starbucks in Seattle has taken part in it. This is, uh, um, and basically, if there, if a victim of a violent crime uh, enters your premise, then staff calls 911 immediately on their behalf, allows them to remain in your business as kind of a safe space shelter until police arrive. Um, if the, um, and if the individual leaves your premise, then you would call the police department and let them know uh, basically where they had gone off to. But basically it's not a lot is required of you, but if you do take part in it, take, ser take it seriously and actually train your staff how to, um, you know, Call nine one one. Keep the keep the individual calm and maintain a safe space for the uh, individual. Um, and then, uh, lastly, I wanted to mention um, um, about workshops that the Cannabis Alliance can do um, to the, as an as an opportunity to have this education be furthered. So like, I don't expect every business, every, every business in the cannabis industry is a small business. So I don't expect every business to go out and hire um, somebody to come in and do a workshop for your business, whatever it may be. But I do feel that the Cannabis Alliance may be able to um, have, hold these kinds, kinds of uh, workshops. And this could be like um, queer history, HIV and sexual health, power, privilege, and oppression, microaggressions, nonviolent communication, intersectionality, um, how to file a claim, how to um, equip management with what they need to be successful and how to retain excellent talent. So basically, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, wraps up what I have for you all. Um, and I will leave some links in the comments. Wonderful, if anyone wanted to get involved with your organization, Neil, how would they go about doing that? Um, well, we are uh, mostly active right now on Facebook. We're going, we're doing monthly meetings currently as well. And um, we, yeah, I will leave all of that beautiful information. Um, yeah. Sweet. 
and is and in full spectrum is a great group to follow on on facebook i got that for you neil gorgeous um, yeah. Yes, you filled us in. I really appreciate you coming and talking about how to become more inclusive because it's it, it's important. It's a, it's even more important as we work our way through all of the latest news events and and finding ways and all of the things you addressed today for LGBTQ individuals could apply to almost anybody in the workplace. Yeah, I will tell everybody that Cannabis Alliance does not have a address code. We don't even require you to wear pants. Shh, don't well, wear uh, secrets. Oh, that's a secret. Oh, oh. Yeah, you and we also not don't wear pants have a online, but when we get back to in person, please. Oh, you have to wear pants. Bottom coverage, in, whatever it is. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, bottom and we coverage is important. We will work together uh, on getting some webinars together um, on yeah. some of the topics that you identified. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate Those it. Are great topics by the way neil i think a lot of us could um because we don't know we I, i'll speak for myself it's uncomfortable to know how to address somebody in terms of pronouns so asking somebody ahead of time you know what is your pronoun and making that a comfort level and that'll just take it'll take some time it'll take time and 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 experience put it that way you don't we'll get there there are so many brands have those enamel pins with their logos on it. Could you imagine if they just made like some pronoun enamel pins with their brand? Yeah, excellent. Simple. Excellent idea. Thank you, Neil. I'm going to turn the time over to Kim Ducote and she's going to take it from here on membership, the member pitches. Hi, everybody. Thank Kim. you, Kristen. Um, boy, we are evolving on a lot of levels in our society, aren't we? So this is just exciting. A really great turnout today. Really glad to see everybody joining us. Um, this is our time for our member spotlight where we um, highlight a couple of our members, let them tell you a little bit about themselves and their businesses so that you all can understand what they're doing and support their businesses and um, we can all just support each other. So um, I have, we have two members today. We have Hempfest and Paragon, and I'm gonna go in alphabetical order. So if Vivian McPeak is ready, would you like to go ahead and, um, and get us started? Vivian, are you there? Yes, I just had to unmute myself. Oh, there you go, thank you. Um, thank you, Kim. Seattle Hemp Fest joined the Cannabis Alliance to remain informed, active, and engaged in this vibrant cannabis industry and to learn about the issues that concern its members. Uh, we are adapting to this COVID-19 environment at the moment and preparing a world-class live stream Hemp Fest slated for mid-October. And uh, because we hope to remain a catalyst for the cannabis community to reach the public and promote the continued growth of the industry. We're currently working to champion consumption opportunities in Washington State, and we just won an appeal to that end uh, just a few days ago, and also to reform the advertising restrictions on cannabis businesses that we feel are unconstitutional. And we invite you all to join us, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our organization. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, next person I'd like to introduce is Stacy McLaughlin with Paragon. Are you with us, Stacy? I, I saw you in there earlier. Yeah, hey. I'm here. Hey. hey guys, I know that you have seen my face for the last couple of years. Um, I'm not a new member. Uh, however, I was a member with another payroll company um, in the past and I made a promise to the Cannabis Alliance that I would be a partner and um, be a partner that stayed with you, not with the brand that I was necessarily representing. So my prior company sold their entire payroll book of business last month off to ADP. We are very familiar uh, in the MRB space what that means. Um, so I wanted to let you know that I am now with uh, Paragon Payroll. We offer payroll, time and attendance, HR and benefit uh, technology. 
not a, like within the MRB space, we're going to walk through, walk you through the front door, make sure you sit at the table with us and it's not a backdoor solution. So we have an MRB compliant banking partner that processes our ACH and taxes for you. Uh, so you just don't have to worry anymore about getting the boot just because you're in the cannabis industry. So thanks so much. I'll put my contact information in the comments. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much, Stacey. And I just wanted to let everybody know that, of course, you can find our members on the member profile, the member tab on our website. And uh, both HempFest and Paragon Payroll are in there if you need a little bit more information. And I also see that Caitlin put um, some uh, websites up as well. So thank you for doing that. Thank you, everybody. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Kim. Do we, uh, we've got a little bit of time. Uh, can we uh, let Vivian answer Sean's question? Yeah, why not? Go for it, Vivian. Okay. Uh, Sean, you wanted to know more about the legal win. Um, we, uh, a, a couple years ago, the uh, Washington, or the Seattle uh, uh, FAS, Financial Administrative Services, sent uh, somebody undercover to our membership party. We do an annual membership uh, program and we have uh, quarterly membership events and we had a private membership party just for our members, all 21 and over, uh, at a private house in Fremont a couple times in a row. And the uh, Seattle FAS sent some undercover folks. They bought a trial membership. They came in to the home and because we were letting people smoke their own cannabis in the backyard, completely out of public view, all 21 uh, years, private party, they issued us a thousand dollar citation for operating a marijuana business without a license. Um, we talked to our friends at the Associated Press who wrote an article and within about a week, uh, the city attorney's office had kind of quashed that, just kind of you know, dropped that citation. And then the next year they did the same thing all over again and didn't, uh, let the citation go. Um, and so we challenged it uh, in, in Superior Court um, and lost. And then we appealed into appellate court and last week we won. Um, and the judge was pretty scathing in the uh, ruling, saying that our rights were violated, that it was vague, and that it uh, was in uh, defiance of state law. Um, and so we're pretty excited. It's up to the city now whether they want to appeal or not. But our legal team, um, which is Douglas Hyatt and Fred Diamondstone, uh, feel that the ruling was so succinct and so kind of uh, uh, unflattering uh, that we're in pretty good shape even if there's an appeal. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're challenging also uh, the constitutionality of the state's anti-advertising uh, law that prohibits cannabis businesses from advertising at public events such as Seattle Hemp Fest. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny because we never expect, and we never expect to win these things except on appeal. Um, and so once again, we, we recently lost in uh, regular court and uh, we're preparing an appeal. However, uh, there was just a ruling um, just last week um, that seemed to bolster our case uh, as well. Um, so, you know, we're just trying to keep up the fight. And, this, and, th and the thing about advertising is for everybody because we think that cannabis businesses should have the same rights that, that other industry has. You know, when I go to Fremont Fair, um, I see the Red Hook stage with giant 12 or 15 foot banners with pictures of Red Hook beer. And directly across from the Red Hook stage is a beer garden with a tiny little picket fence with children walking by and people drinking beer right in front of everybody in the whole world, including the children. Um, and as we know, alcohol, you know, directly kills about 40,000 people a year. Um, and who knows how many indirectly, um, and cannabis doesn't kill anybody. So uh, we feel that, that mar marijuana businesses should have the right to advertise. Um, and that events, which are just, you know, we're all hurting, man, we're being decimated along with everybody else. Um, but events even before COVID, events in Seattle were having a hard time. Um, and, you know, sponsorship base is extremely important and there's no reason that the cannabis industry shouldn't be able to have access um, to sponsorship opportunities for uh, all the great, you know, events that happen throughout the state. 
Thank you, Vivian. Like that agreed. I'm very pleased to see how things are progressing. Thank you. Um, so thank you. Um, a couple things before we'll wrap this up. Uh, don't forget the Cannabis Alliance has opportunities for you uh, in terms of we have some sections which are more interest-based. So we have a hemp section, we have a women's section, and we have a, a Latinx section. So if you want to be um, included on those, please let me know. Uh, those are great ways to get some more information and to share uh, common information, uh, common themes. I know Jerry Whiting is on um, the call today and he runs our hemp section and they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're interesting and they, they share information and they share things that are going on in, in the hemp industry as well as what's going on with women and, and Latinx. And then we have uh, committees. We have uh, the new sustainability committee Previously, the Packaging Committee now has moved to the Sustainability Committee, and um, we can always use more volunteers. So please shoot myself or Jill over an email if you would like to be more involved and get more out there. And we also, as before, the closing note is uh, the summit. The summit is coming up. It's September 24th and 25th. We have our lineup announced. The agenda is online. I will shoot over. Uh, the summit um, lineup, but it's going to be really exciting. We're 76 days away. It's going to be virtual. Everybody that has experienced the platform has really found it to be very interactive. Um, it's going to be, I think it's going to be really amazing and I look forward to actually attending it. So um, we'll be talking about some of the biomass, creating an ethical culture and um, out-of-state funding, some what's going on with the medical marijuana patients, and then Pete Holmes will be our closing speaker, which is kind of funny considering what you've just experienced, Vivian. So maybe you could ask him some real quick questions, pointed questions. Anyway, uh, so th that's how it is coming up, and we're, like, we're really looking forward to it. It has been my absolute pleasure to serve as your executive director these past seven months. And um, like I've said, I am heartbroken to leave, but I am not going anywhere. I'm just changing roles. Makes me feel like I'm dying. Anyway, um, thank you all for attending our, our weekly meeting. And Caitlin, do you have anything to close? Um, I don't think so, other than, uh, you know, hard times, we get through it by uh, community and family, and uh, we certainly see the Cannabis Alliance as a family, and um, want to thank you all for uh, your support, your thoughtfulness, and uh, looking forward to attending to this new task uh, in this new new world and reality, and, and with a group of folks like we've got here on, on this meeting today, I know we're up for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Oh, who's, who's, who's volunteering to write the fight song? Somebody has to write the fight song. Well, if you're not going to be ED anymore, then you're going to have some more time. You need to do that. Get on it. I may be bored. I will write the fight song. All right. You got it. <laughs> Thanks all. Thank you, everybody. Jill, you were first in. You waiting to be last out? <laughs> I like to see who forgot and left their video on. Oh, I'm always afraid. You know, I like like when you go to the bathroom and you got your headphones in. If you got to yeah. run in there real quick, yeah, I got you. Yeah, it, it's my favorite game to see who who has forgotten to turn their screen. Like, it makes for a funny story, but not necessarily a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think it's like one of the funniest things is we have to like tell people not to take their zoom calls into the bathroom with them <laughs> you know yeah they, yeah like, if you've got <laughs> headphones and you're nowhere near it like a, a microphone sure but like <laughs> don't bring like don't be trying to pee with zoom on your phone <laughs> right oh uh, yeah oh no and no i didn't forget jill i know i was one of the ones that you were waiting to see
Uh, no, just in general, like, Jeremy has <laughs> forgotten about us, and Ryan has forgotten about us. <laughs> Jerry, I'm out. Have a good one. Thanks for hosting again. Yeah, no worries. Bye, y'all. Okay. Bye. <laughs> okay, Ryan, you are here. Hi. Bye. <laughs> okay, but for reals, reals. Bye, guys. <laughs> also, my dogs are horrible, and I left chicken out to chop up and went upstairs and took a shower really quick because I needed it to thaw and so now I need to bring you a bag of chicken strips oh no so that you can chop them up and put them on top okay deal <laughs> do you have any cheese by the way yeah you mean like fake cheese yeah well for you yeah yeah yes I was actually going to ask you the same thing do you have fake mots no I have fake pepper jack like a smidge okay that'll work I'm just I made goulash and I think it's better with a little bit of cheese in it but oh yeah okay so, granted, it's not like our stuff actually melts properly. So, poor Dustin. Well, but, like, you should throw a ton of your cheese in it. Yes, I do have a meat cheese. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, when do you want to come over? Also, I feel like this picture doesn't even look like me. I love it, though. You look, like, happy and professional. I like it. I was in line waiting for Starbucks. Nice. On board. Um, that natural lighting. Yeah, gotta love that natural lighting. But yeah, I'm gonna finish this and hit the store and come to your house. Okay, word. Give me natural a call lighting. when you're headed my way. What? It said give me a call or text me before you're headed my way. Oh, it'll be like five minutes. Oh, perfect. Okay, cool. Okay. Right, bye. 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 Quietly paying attention.